check these out. I reckon they'll add something a little extra special for Easter. Later in the program, I'll show you how to make these beautiful Greek Easter eggs using all natural dyes found in the garden with the help of some old family friends. But first, let's have a look at what's coming up on this week's show. I'll show you how to be a plant detective by looking for the clues that will help solve the identity of that mystery plant. Aren't these fantastic borders? I get to meet the man who's created them and he's also an absolute expert in photographing beautiful gardens too. And this nectarine is coming out because it's really struggling. I'll tell you why and more importantly, put something else in that I know will do very well. Don't you just love reading gardening books, especially if they've got really fabulous photographs? They are so inspirational. And today I'm so fortunate because I'm about to meet a really well-respected garden photographer. Plus, I'm going to go to see his garden. And also, he's going to give us a few tips about how to take really good photographs in your own garden. Simon Griffith's photographic works have been published in many magazines and more than 70 books. Simon and his partner live at Kyneton, an hour and a bit northwest of Melbourne. What I like about this garden is that it's really relaxed. You know, you've got plenty of stuff in it and it's just got a lovely feel. Yeah, it's cram packed full of all my favourite things. Why so much cramming? Uh, they all hold each other up, mm. so you don't need to stake anything if everything's really tightly planted. Now, this is on two sides, you've got the borders yeah. and the grass in the middle, and then yep. on the other side, what happens there? Well, then we have different areas of the garden. So we've got the vegetable garden mm -hmm. over here, and then there's the entertaining area over there, the terrace. And some of your favourite plants, what would they be? Roses, I guess? Stripy roses, ah. probably one of my favourite mm -hmm. things in the whole world. Yeah and the white Himalayan blackberry over here. Now tell me about that, I don't know it. So it's deciduous and in winter it looks like the, the canes have all been spray painted white. They're wow. absolutely amazing and stunning in winter. Does it have fruit? No, it never has fruit. Okay. It seems to have flowers but it never fruits. Okay, it looks a nice one though. And I can see a little, nice little cottagey sort of thing in there. Oh, that's Ian's studio. That's where he works during the day. So that's lovely. He's an architect. Yeah, and you put that in? Yeah, we, we renovated an existing shed. And you've got some really beautiful trees that really do give great bones to the garden. Yeah, we were lucky enough to inherit the cedar and the elm over here and at the back there is the hawthorn hawthorns. hedge. And, yeah. and the hawthorns, that's sort of part of this area, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. The hedge is, hedge is very traditional. Mm. OK, follow me. It's just a beautiful feel to it. These Flanders poppies look like they've just grown here quite naturally, but there's more to this area than just a drift of flowers. Ha! <laughs> That's a good dog race, isn't it? It is a good dog race. <laughs> does he just go up and down like this all the time? Oh, he goes round and round. He does circuits of the garden. Oh, that's fantastic. This one's far too old and this too is, dignified. Uh, yeah, this is Massimo. He's 14, so yeah. he's, past, he's past his running oh, days. He's, he's lovely, though. He's a very cute dog, aren't you, eh? And I noticed this wonderful cardoon. Yeah, the cardoons are fantastic. Yeah. I got the seed originally from Susan Irvine. She had a huge oh, colony the of them. Oh, lovely rose lady. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, and she gave me some seed and I'm still growing them. Now, are they edible? No, that part of them isn't edible. Okay. But down in the, the leaf part, this bit here, the stem, okay. is, is, is what you eat. I think they're so architectural, aren't they? They are. They're yeah. fantastic to In grow. fact, you've got lots of kind of really good architectural plants. Yeah, big, old... tall things. Queen yeah. Anne's lace. It's lovely. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Easy to grow. Easy to grow, and in amongst everything, it just looks yep. fabulous. Yeah. Bit of a cut back in autumn, and away you oh, go. Oh, yes. <laughs> good for the compost. Now that plant that I spotted down here, that blue one, everyone wants to know what it is. Oh, that's Cerinthi Major. Yes. Everyone that comes to the garden asks, what's that blue plant? Yeah, little shrimp yes, sort of flowers, aren't they? Blue yeah. shrimp plant. Yeah, amazing. I like your little veggie garden, but I in particular like this plant. Tell ah, me Ah, the thornless blackberry. This is just one plant yeah. and we loop it around some stakes here and it grows and we get about six, seven, sometimes eight kilos of fruit off one plant. Wow, and, and does it, you have to prune it a lot? 
Uh, once it's finished its fruiting, you cut off that year's growth, and then this is next year's growth over here. Oh, look at it. Gee, how strong is that? I also wanted to show you um, oh. the garden shed. Oh, that's lovely. Now, that's part of Ian's studio, yes, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I asked him if I could have a metre of uh, his studio to make a little garden tool shed. Yeah. But he only gave me 80 centimetres, so it's, it's <laughs> kind of tiny. <laughs> oh, it's very neat and nice, though, isn't it? Yeah. I often think that you can tell a person's personality by looking in their garden shed. You sure can. <laughs> Simon, this is a lovely place to sit and have a cuppa. This is the part of the garden we use the most here, and we live out here in summer. How important is shade? I mean, this DDR is just fantastic. Very important in a climate like Kyneton, yes. where we get hot, hot summers. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way you've just got it very simple with the, the rug, especially for the dog. Yes, the, the dogs don't like to sit on the granitic sand. <laughs> So they have their own Persian rug for the garden. And this is your little gesture for formality, is it, with the, uh, the topiary box? Yes, there? my little topiary collection that um, I clip twice a year to keep them looking good. And uh, this is what I use to uh, trim it. These are Japanese box shears. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, aren't they beautiful? They're specifically designed for trimming your box bushes. Oh, that's just lovely, isn't yeah. it? This is a real photographer's garden. It's as pretty as a picture. And Simon will be back later in the program to give you some tips on how to take beautiful photos in your own garden. Can you use compost in replacement of potting mix? Well, potting mix has been designed and manufactured to have certain qualities. Good amounts of air, good drainage, good water and nutrient holding capacity, as well as a stable pH. Whereas compost can vary depending on what it's been made out of. So, yes, you can grow plants in straight compost, but if they're in pots, they'll do far better with a good potting mix with some of this black gold added to it. It's a common term in gardening, but not everyone's clear on what deadheading is. It simply means to cut off the old flower spike to encourage more flowers. By deadheading regularly, it gives you a longer flowering period, and I'm going to get to enjoy this buddleia for months to come. I'd like to introduce you to this plant, the golden plume, Shower. Flavicoma. It's a relative of a very common garden plant, the shrimp plant, Justicia brandegiana. And just like the Justicia, both of them thrive in a frost-free climate. So you can grow this from Sydney right the way up to Cairns. All this plant requires is some leafy soil with a little bit of compost, a little bit of moisture and some dappled shade. And in that situation, it will reliably self-seed. So the main purpose of this plant is as a bed filler or as a mass planting. I've only seen this plant twice in my life, so I'm going to take a seedling. This is something I want to cultivate. The occasional failure is an intrinsic part of gardening. If we're to learn and increase our knowledge, we have to try out different ideas. But it's a fact of life that some things just don't work out. So don't let it get you down. I don't. Plan A was to grow temperate fruit trees right along this fence line. But it hasn't worked out. You can see the nectarines were pretty crook. And I had apricots here. They went far south, so I've already pulled those out. And there's a reason why. It's simply too hot. This is a north-facing fence line. It's also metal. There's concrete blocks and the gravel driveway. And this sensor has been telling me that at times it's at least five degrees hotter than the surrounding garden. So time for plan B. And that's fruit trees that like it hot. Mango, olive and mulberry. As I've dug up the stunted trees, something else is evident. The Mexican marigolds that I've planted to attract beneficial insects have done really well with the heat, but they're robbing soil moisture from the fruit trees. 
so I'm going to keep them well back from the new plantings. Now it's time to prepare the soil for planting. I'm starting by digging a hole about three times the width of the root ball and just slightly deeper. Then in goes some compost to build up the body of the soil and then some organic fertiliser, including pelletised manure and rock manures. Then some of the original garden soil back in and I'll blend it all up. And then tamping it with my foot just to settle the soil and then a good soak of water to settle it all down. The first one to go in is this dwarf black mulberry, which in standard form would grow to about four metres. Now, I have actually grown mulberries on trellis before with great success. Okay, what I'm gonna do here is gently tease the root ball so there's no tangled roots. You can see those new roots coming out and they'll get into the fresh garden soil. Pop them in, make sure the top of the root ball is in line with the surrounding garden bed. Nice and centre to where I want it. And then just backfill with that improved soil. Bit of compost around the top. Blend that in, keep backfilling. Now it's time for a really good drink. Okay, time for some formative pruning. Because I'm going to be training this mulberry along this trellis to grow it on a two-dimensional plane to save space, I only want one central leader to form the main trunk, and it's the branches that come off this that I'll train to these trellis lines. So it means that these two other shoots have to go. And I'll finish it off with a bit of mulch. Mulberries are proven performers in Perth's hot conditions. And the next one, Olive, well, this has been growing in really hot, summer dry climates for thousands of years. I'm preparing the planting hole for this one, just the same as the mulberry. The variety is good old fashioned Kalamata, a large pickling type and one of my favorites. The last one to go in today is mango, which of course coming from the tropics, thrives in the heat provided it gets enough moisture. Now this variety is Kensington Pride, and it's one that does very well in Perth, it fruits well here, and it also seems to cope okay with our cool winters. Now normally, it grows into a big tree, which is why I'm going to trellis it, to stunt its growth. Now there's still some experimentation here, because I've never done it before. I've heard it can be done, and I'm keen to give it a shot. These fruit trees cost between 20 and $30 each. The compost, fertiliser and mulch, all up around $30. So in total, this job cost around 100 bucks. When these fruit trees fill out and screen this fence, they'll look terrific. And the plan is they'll convert the sun and the heat into fruit. So remember, if at first you don't succeed, plant, plant, plant again. Well, the two things that I was good at school at were science and art, and I suppose photography is a mixture of the two things. I've been shooting for 25 years. I travel a lot overseas. I travel a lot around Australia. I shoot for magazines and books. Uh, I do houses, all sorts of things, but my great love is shooting gardens. I think you learn something from every single garden that you go to. And it doesn't matter whether it's a small suburban backyard or a big country garden, you always learn something from every garden. Without a doubt, my favourite garden would be Great Dixter in the UK. Absolutely amazing garden, cram-packed full of unusual and rare things. And it's just amazing. In any season, you must go and see Great Dixter. Now to those tips on taking great photos of your garden. Light is everything for shooting gardens. Uh, if you avoid the middle of the day when the sun's harsh and shoot either really early in the morning or late, late in the afternoon, you get lovely long shadows and the light's really interesting and quite magical. Another option is to shoot on an overcast day when you get uh, lots and lots of detail in the image and you avoid getting dark shadows. 
do something different, find a different perspective or a point of view of the garden that you're photographing. A ladder can help, but do do it safely. Try shooting in different weather conditions. Just before a storm when there's dramatic clouds uh, in the sky can be fantastic. Or early on a frosty morning can be great to shoot. Keep shooting. Take quite a few shots every week and review your work over a period of time. You'll find that your work's improving and in no time at all you'll be taking great garden photographs. So, what are you waiting for? Get out there and start shooting. The surefire way to identify a plant is to use the technology available in a botany laboratory. But not many of us have access to a botanic gardens and its high-powered microscopes and DNA technology. So what if you want to find out what that plant is in your garden or that fantastic looking tree in the local park? What do you look for and how do you find out what it is? It's just a matter of using some simple observational techniques to narrow it down to the most likely suspects. By using the right clues, you're well on your way to becoming a plant detective. Clue number one, flowers. Without a doubt, this is the best way to identify most plants. Firstly, have a look at the shape. Is it tubular, disc-shaped, trumpet-shaped, or is it lipped? For instance, all of these plants are salvias, and from a distance they look quite different. But when you get up close, they all have a tubular flower with a large lip. This is characteristic of the family Lamiaceae. Every plant in this family has a similar shaped flower. Next, look at how the flowers are arranged. Are they single or clustered together in a particular arrangement, like an umbel or a spike? Shape and arrangement help to narrow down the family because plants in the same family tend to have similar flower arrangements. Other plants like mosses and ferns don't have any flowers at all. They reproduce from spores that form directly on the foliage and that in itself is a strong clue as to what they might be. In this case, a luscious polypodium fern. A couple of other groups that don't have flowers are cycads and conifers. These ancient plants don't have their seeds enclosed in fruits formed from flowers. Rather, they're held in cones. Clue number two, appearance. Look for the obvious. Is it a tree, a shrub, vine or ground cover? How big is it and what is its shape? Rounded? pyramid or is it weeping? In the case of a palm, the shape is instantly recognisable. A long, thin trunk topped by a small tuft of foliage. Clue number three, leaves. Take a really close look at the foliage, the veination, the size, shape and colour. Is it a single leaf on a big long stalk like this magnificent xanthosoma? Or is it a composite leaf made up of smaller leaflets? Does the plant lose its leaves every year? In other words, is it deciduous or is the plant evergreen? Clue number four, bark. For trees and shrubs, there's often not a lot to look at at eye level. So have a close look at the bark. Is it stringy, is it rough, is it plate-like, or is it smooth with distinctive blotches like this classic Australian eucalypt, the spotted gum? As a young horticulturist, I learned a tremendous number of species by poring over plant books like this one and visiting places like the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, where they've got some very helpful signage. And these days, there's all sorts of websites, search engines, social media, and of course, our very own Gardening Australia website. And if you want to look at the latest varieties, why not look at the Gardening Australia magazine? There's all sorts of ways to learn about plants. So arm yourself with a few facts and you'll be identifying that mystery plant in no time. It's elementary, my dear viewer.
every year as far back as I can remember, my family and friends have got together to create colourful dyed Greek Easter eggs. Well, I've got some eggs from my chickens at home and I'm ready to get creative with this year's batch. Hey, how are you? How are you? Hi, girls. How are you going? You good? Oh, look who's in charge up the back here. And how are you? <laughs> you know, the world is in order if Ange is giving me stick about the beard. <laughs> Everything is fine in the I've world. I've known Maria and her mum, Angela, for most of my life. And today, Maria's invited her two nieces, Pamela and Zoe, along to help us create what I think will be some pretty amazing Easter eggs. So look at these eggs, girls. I remember when I was your age... And I used to do egg dyeing with my Ia and my mum. It was lots of fun, wasn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, we dye red eggs for Easter. And uh, they symbolise that Christ has risen. And on Saturday night, we crack them. And whosoever egg is not broken is the winner and yeah. has good luck for the year. Yeah, the champion for the champion, year. Champion, and you keep that egg. Now, there's my eggs, Maria. I've selected all of my white ones. White are the best because they show up the colour. And they haven't been in the fridge, have they? No. No, because room temperature is the best, because that way when we boil them, they don't break. OK. Now, Zoe, what have we got here? Beetroot. What colour do you think we're going to get out of the beetroot? Purpley red. Purpley red? Yeah, I think you're right. And what about over here, Pamela? What have we got? Onion. What colour will come out of the onions, do you think? Brown. Do you think they'll make you cry as well? Um, maybe. <laughs> and what else have we got here, Marie? We've got some stockings and some ties and some little stickers. We can also um, get the girls to pick some leaves from the garden and we put them on and we dye them, tie them with the stocking and when we take it off, it leaves the imprint of the leaf. Oh, wow. Do, so they make you... really pretty eggs. What do you think? Do you girls want to come up and we'll pick some, some flowers and some leaves? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like fun to me. OK, let's have a look in the garden. Now, do either of you know what plant this is? Rosemary. Now, if we cut off about that much, that's the pattern that we'll get on the egg, OK? There's lots of different plant leaves and flowers you can use, but it's best to stick to edible plants and the ones that you know. For a list of the obvious ones to avoid, check out the fact sheet on our website. This is a chicory flower, and I think that pattern will come up beautifully on our eggs. And then look what we've got here, some beautiful basil. So let's cut some of these off, cut that one off. And the last one over there is the oregano. Let's get a little bit of that. Take it off right at the bottom there. What have you been up to, Maria? Well, I've cut up some stockings ready for the eggs. We've got some um, onion leaves and some stickers. So we can get working. All right. Well, grab an egg, girls. Tightly press the leaves and flowers against the eggs with pieces of stocking. This will hold everything together, but it'll also let the dye through to colour the eggs. Look at that one. See the purple flower? Yeah. Then I'll put it face down. Mm -hmm. So we should get the pattern of the flower. We'll put some rosemary with the stickers. Yeah? Look at that, Maria. It's like a spider. Yeah, it does look like a spider, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, tie that off, Zoe. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> well, I think we've done incredibly well. We're up to about 15 eggs and we've had our first casualty. The stocking hasn't quite caught her artwork, but she's ahead of her time. I love your work. Well done, Zoe. <laughs> OK, Maria, here's some more cut veggies. Okay. I've got some onions there. All right, there they go. I've got a little bit of beetroot here and some more cabbage. Now, tell me, what's the boiling technique? I don't know. I, really, it's experimental. So we'll see how we go, but I think about an hour to get a colour. We're already getting a bit of colour. Yep. And what's the purpose of the vinegar? The vinegar will make the eggs hold the colour more. OK. So I think we'll splash some in now. What quantity? Just, like, half a cup, a I would say. A splash. Yeah, good. A splash. splash. You half know that cup. measurement. It's written on the side of all good Greeks don't kitchenware. <laughs> Just a splash, a Greek splash. Now the dye colour is strong enough... We'll add the eggs and simmer slowly for about an hour. I'm really excited to see how they've turned out. Let's start unwrapping, eh? Whoa! That's so pretty. Look at the pattern here. Like a Take off the stocking and all the bits yeah. of plant material and stickers to reveal the beautiful finished Easter eggs. 
and that's where you put the chicory flower. Let's try that one. Look how white the egg is underneath where we took the sticker yeah, off. Yeah, and the love heart. This looks like the one we covered in onion leaves. Yeah. Finish off by rubbing a bit of oil on the eggs to make them look even better. Look at the result. And the best thing is, it's all come from the garden. Now, we all know that gardening is good for us. And whether it's participating in a project like this, getting your hands in the soil, or even just enjoying the produce from your patch, it's good to know that just spending time in the garden is good for our well-being. Here's what's in store next week. Make a note in your diary. April is allium month. Onions, chives, leeks, shallots, and of course, garlic. And I'm in a garden which is a blaze of colour all year round, thanks in no small part to a chance encounter and a very generous gift. Check these out. I reckon they'll add something a little extra special for Easter. Later in the program, I'll show you how to make these beautiful Greek Easter eggs using all natural dyes found in the garden with the help of some old family friends. But first, let's have a look at what's coming up on this week's show. I'll show you how to be a plant detective by looking for the clues that will help solve the identity of that mystery plant. Aren't these fantastic borders? I get to meet the man who's created them and he's also an absolute expert in photographing beautiful gardens too. And this nectarine is coming out because it's really struggling. I'll tell you why and more importantly, put something else in that I know will do very well. Don't you just love reading gardening books, especially if they've got really fabulous 